Well, now that Linda's here, we can uh, we can get started. Uh, now that Jim's really here, we can get really started. <laughs> All right, let's. Uh, yeah, I see we have folks shouting in anyway, so um, thank y'all for being here. Let me uh, ask before I pray if somebody could hand out uh, a stapled handout, so you know when we do history classes, I give you. Pictures and, and quotes of galore. It's not just for right now to be distracted. It's for the rest of the week or the rest of your life. You want to keep it around. Just some fun quotes, interesting, thoughtful quotes, and uh, maybe a, a picture or two to stimulate you while I'm boring. <clears throat> but uh, let me let me go ahead and uh, and 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 pray, and then we can get uh, get started. Let me let me bow our heads and. Uh, go before our God. Lord, we praise you that you're the God of history. You're the Lord who loves your church. You care for her. You grant to her your spirit. You give to her your word. Speak to us now. Show us the path of uh, becoming more and more like Christ that is reforming ourselves and your, your bride. Make her more spotless today than she was yesterday. Do the same with us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, so we are, we are really in week two of our series on the uh, Reformation, and this is a classic period. I think if there's one period that most of us in this room know more about besides our own, and maybe sometimes more than our own, it is the Reformation. But I'm not sure that we all know what we all need to know about the Reformation. So let me open up with this question I want you to have in your mind. Really, the question throughout the course, but today I'm going to give you this question, which is, how far is too far? How far is too far? How far is too far when it comes to Reformation? When does Reformation become revolution? Or to put it a different way, how far, when, when do you leave the church in a wrong way? How far is too far when it comes to leaving the body of Christ? When does revolution become something that's uh, not good? Reformation becomes something that, that's not ideal. So, we're going to discuss here uh, our second week in the life of Martin Luther. We left him last time in a bit of a pickle. If you remember, he had gone to Rome. He had traveled as a monk. And he had gone there. He had seen the extravagance of the Pope, the extravagance of the buildings, all the architecture. And he had been troubled by it. He walks up the steps of this huge cathedral, very famous steps in Rome, and he's praying every step for his parents. He says, if I could get them out of purgatory, I would, but I can't. I try to pray hard, but I, I, don't, I don't get the feeling that they're out of there anymore. So now we come to the life of Luther and where he goes from Rome. We'll start here first with his, his time as a professor. Remember that Luther, primarily the Reformation, Martin Luther, this is a key point, is not some rabble-rouser. He's not some crazy, fanatical, bug-eyed cult leader. He's not Jim Jones. He's not starting some uh, revolution. That's really one of the key points we want to make uh, this morning. He is simply a nerd like Pastor John. So if you want to think of Martin Luther, you may as well think of somebody who's a nerdy monk, somebody who teaches. He gets his reformational ideas through reading and studying the Bible and talking to students and praying and preaching. He gets it through the basics of the Christian life. Now, I mentioned briefly last time, I want to cover it again a little bit here. His first major breakthrough, his first major breakthrough, often labeled his tower experience. He has his tower experience. 
This is a chief moment in Luther's own life. He's reading, he's teaching, he's preaching through the book of Romans. He comes to Romans 1, verse 17. Classic verse, hopefully be good if he had it memorized. He says this, he reads this, the gospel, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith as it's written, the righteous shall live by faith. You can see what he says right here. I give you this quote. He says, though I live as a monk, right? You think you're a good person? Luther was a monk. Luther was praying more than any of us pray. Probably he prayed more in a day than most of us pray in a whole week. He was a monk. He was a professional holy man. And yet, he says this, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience, right? Luther is extremely disturbed. That means that he's depressed, he's anxious, he's worried. He reads the Bible, he believes in God, he believes in the devil, he believes in demons and spirits. Mentioned that last time. I could not believe that God was placated, that he was made happy by my satisfaction. What could I do? I did not love, this is Luther, I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. You ever felt that one? Right. If, if your view of God is that he's simply someone who punishes sinners and you can't do anything to get out of that, Luther's right there with you. He says, yes, I hate him. And secretly, if not blasphemously, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God. So what did he do? I mean, this, moment, this, is, this is the culmination really of years of torment. He's a professional Christian. He's in the church He's working and praying and teaching, and yet he's talking to his mentor. I mentioned his mentor last time, Von Staupitz. He goes to confession for six hours. Have you ever confessed your sins to anybody for six hours? He goes there for six hours, and, and his mentor, Von Staupitz, says, just stop, Martin. Stop. stop. I can't do it. You're, 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 you need to stop this. You're doing too much. But Luther could not get any relief from his anxiety, from his worry, until... Look at the quote again, top of your page. At last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I gave heed to the context of Romans 1.17 in the gospel, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. As it is written, he through faith is righteous shall live. Then I begin to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous lives by the gift of God, namely by faith. In the words, what is Luther's great first turn? His, faith, his, his great breakthrough is, is to realize that, uh, well, Christ is no longer a judge that Luther cannot appease. He is the one who has fulfilled the righteousness of God. And you can receive that by faith. By faith in Christ alone, the ungodly are pardoned from all guilt and they receive every assurance. This is the key. So many of us struggle. I've had numerous conversations with folks who have a similar level of anxiety, worry, stress, depression. I don't feel like I'm a good person. I don't measure up, Pastor John. Over and over again, I could just point them to this verse right here and say, look, do you want to know how to be assured that you are saved, that you're a Christian? Look right here by faith. Jesus has done it all. He receives you by His mercy. You don't have to measure up by giving satisfaction back to Him. He has done it all. Now, this, is, uh, this really is a, a critical moment for, for Luther, and it comes in the context of him being overworked. You see, he's not just uh, spiritually taxed. He's physically taxed. Let me give you a little in, in, insight into his life. He's teaching three classes, uh, three different classes every day, huge lectures, and these lectures are not just sitting up in front of people and talking to them. These are what they call disputations, where you'd give people a question, and the student would answer, and then you'd have to rebut them, and they'd last for hours. Moreover, he's a monk, so what does he have to do? He has to pray. He has to sing the Psalms. He has to go to morning church and afternoon church and evening church every day. 
He has letters that come in because he's a good professor. He has letters, he says, enough for two secretaries. And guess how many he has? I think it's the same as Pastor John, which is zero. So he's busy. He's busy writing. He's preaching regularly, not just to the monks, but also to the city church. He is supervising 11 different little monastic groups called cloisters. And he adds on here, plus he is the warden of the fish pond. I don't know what that means. He has to feed the fish. That's Martin Luther for you. He's a busy guy. He barely, he says this, he barely has enough time to celebrate mass. Besides, I have my own struggles with the flesh, the world and the devil. See what a lazy man I am. This is the kind of guy he, he thinks. He thinks I'm so lazy, I'm not doing anything. And yet he's always active. You know anybody like that? You know anybody who is always active and yet they're, oh, I'm so lazy, right? This is the guy we're talking about here. Martin Luther. So on the... Uh, on the heels of his labors, his physical exertion, he's worn out. He has this uh, tower experience sometime in the 15 teens. We're not quite sure when. And then he has a second break. He has a second breakthrough. He has a breakthrough that's based upon the question of grace. His first breakthrough, Romans 117, right? God's righteousness. It's a gift. His second breakthrough is from the question of grace. This is 1517. Second breakthrough. A fall day, September 1517. One of his students, Franz Gunther, he rose to defend his bachelor's thesis. That's how you got, that got the degree back in the day. You had to defend a thesis. You had to do it orally, and you get peppered with questions. And the way it worked is actually your professor would tell you the question ahead of time, and you'd be expected to defend it. In most cases, it was easy. The student passed, and there were just an exam. This was different, though, because Luther gives uh, very famous theses at this point. He gives uh, his... 93 theses, not 95 theses, which we're all familiar with. He gives his 93 theses, two less, two fewer. And these theses are all about, they're all about his academic context. This is where Martin Luther breaks decisively with being a middle-aged man. Not a middle-aged man, but a man of the Middle Ages, a medieval man. He breaks with his background. Do you know how hard it is to break with your background? If you're Southern, do you know how hard it is to break from your family, from your upbringing? Some of y'all done that. Has it been fun and easy? No, it's not. It's been hard. It's been difficult. What is the default religious experience in the South today? Some kind of vague Jesus love. Vague church that's baptistic in some way, but love Jesus and that's about it. Go to church occasionally when you feel like it, and that's, a, that's good enough. You've broken with that, by and large. How's that been for you? It's been a challenge. Well, Luther is now doing the same thing. Luther is breaking, right? Reformation is not just changing an a organization. Reformation is not just writing a bunch of uh, uh, nerdy books on the Bible. Reformation is personal. It costs Luther something, and it costs him something here because he breaks with his job. He breaks with his job and the people around him. He breaks with a guy, uh, I'll give you the name for fun, a guy by the name of Gabriel Beal, who was a, a late German, late medieval German guy who argued very famously his idea was that if you do what lies within you, God will not deny grace. If you do what lies within you, God is required to give you grace. This is what he called the little pact or le petit covenant, because I guess he used French, even though he was German. I don't know why the scholars use French to define that. But Gabriel Beale was famous. He was the guy to go to in the late Middle Ages because he said, look, God is so kind that if you do what you can, your best, if you try your hardest, God has already said, look, that's good enough for me. 
you're going to get into heaven. Or at least not a lot of purgatory. And this was the standard way to view God in the Middle Ages. In fact, today it's still the standard view of the Roman Catholic Church as regards people who do not know Christ. Vatican II says, look, if you're uh, a practicing Buddhist, you've never heard of Jesus, you're over in India, and as long as you do what lies within you, you do what is good, what you know to be a good life, if you try really hard, then God will get you into heaven. And that's the way it works today, and that's by, by and large the way most, most people live today. Not just over there, but over here. As long as you do good things, enough of them, God will get you into heaven and you'll be happy. That's Gabriel Beale. I guess I'll give you his last name, right, Beale? And Luther was raised reading Gabriel Beale. He was raised being taught Gabriel Beale. And in 1517, in his 93 theses, not 95, we'll get to the 95 in a bit, his 93 theses, it's basically a nerdy professor talking to other nerdy professors. And he says this, however, it's very important, very provocative. He, he says something like this. The best preparation for grace and the sole disposition toward grace is the eternal election and predestination of God. You see, Gabriel Beale had said, the way you get ready for God to work in you is you try really, really hard to do good things. And Luther says, you cannot try to prepare yourself for God to work in your life. You cannot force God to work in your life, no matter how hard you try, no matter how intense you are, no matter how much you pray, God has to do it. His eternal election and he, his predestination. You see, that this shift is dramatic. And here is where Luther begins to make his huge contrast between law and grace. Law and grace. He spent 20 of his 93 theses on the difference between law and grace, which Beale, he says, has messed up. Luther says this, the law is our taskmaster. What the law wants, however, the will never wants. The law is our taskmaster, and what the law wants, our wills never want. Condemned are all who do the works of the law, he wrote, quoting the New Testament, quoting the Apostle Paul. So Luther breaks. And he breaks in one other huge area. Before we get to there, which is really the flashpoint of the, of the Reformation in Germany, any questions so far? Comments? Share concerns? All right. Great. Yes, I didn't pause very much because we have to get on. Luther breaks on a second area with his academic friends, his fellow monks. He breaks in the area of the picture that uh, you have in your little outline. And by the way, I don't know what all the picture is look, looking, uh, referring to. It's a fun picture, though. Uh, you can look at it and try to analyze it yourself. Um, it reminds me, uh, Rusty, of some of the trolls from uh, The Hobbit a little bit. So maybe that's where Tolkien got it from. Uh, Luther breaks on the question of an indulgence. So let me open it up for y'all. This is the famous part of the, uh, the Protestant Reformation. What's an indulgence? What in your idea, in your, what, what you know of, what's an indulgence? Paying for the absolution of sin. Very, very, very good, Taylor. Very, very, very close. I mean, by and large, correct, but the slight, slight distinction here. I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, it's paying for sin, but paying for what part of sin? That's the question. See, in, in the late medieval church, sin did two things to you. In the late medieval Catholic church, sin did two things. Sin made you guilty, and sin made you need to be punished. You had the guilt and you had the penalty. And the guilt, because Christ is so kind to die for you, you can get rid of the guilt by going to confession and telling the priest. Tell the priest, you've done this wrong thing, and the guilt is wiped. You're no longer guilty, but there's a problem. 
still got to pay for it because nobody gets out of being guilty without getting punishment, right? You have to pay for it. And this is where uh, we have the concept of purgatory because what happens if you commit a really bad sin or you're just doing a lot of sins and you don't have time to make up for them in this life? You know, you're a serial killer and you just keep on killing people and you're confessing to the priest and all that and he's shocked, of course, uh, but you only make up for one murder and you got 10 more to make up for. What do you do? Apparently Christ isn't good enough. The cross wasn't good enough for that. So what do you do with, for the penalty? You've got to serve your time. Now, you've confessed, of course, you're a Christian. I mean, you'll get to heaven eventually, but you have to serve your time. How much time? I don't know. There was no set time. It was always undefined, which is great for kind of getting, uh, getting more money out of people. But always undefined, right? So where do you pay for it? You pay for it in a place called purgatory. When you die... You're a faithful Christian. I mean, purgatory, by the way, is a great place. It's only for those who are going to be saved, right? So it, it's not for the bad people. Purgatory is a great place, according to the late medieval church. You should want to go there because it means you eventually you'll get into heaven. It's like the foyer of heaven. You've just got to mill around there and serve your time a little bit, and eventually you'll come in the sanctuary. I mean, the bad people go to hell. You know, Dante's Inferno, they're, seven, they're all the circles. Uh, the bad, the unsaved go there. You're not unsaved. You're a great Catholic Christian. You'll go to purgatory. And in fact, only the super saints, only Mary, only the apostles, only the really, really amazing saints could ever dream of going directly to heaven when they die. All of us would be in purgatory for a little time at least. So how do you start to pay off the penalty here well, it's by uh, doing penance, by repenting through doing penance. Baptism wipes away all your sins before you, you were baptized. But what if you got baptized and you still commit sins? Well, you've got to do penance. What they call the second plank of salvation. Now, a key part of doing penance comes to be, by Luther's day, what we call an indulgence. It is a relaxation of the penalty of sin. What is an indulgence? It's a relaxation of the penalty of sin. It, it makes the penalty lesser. You know, it's like when you do a plea deal. You get a lesser penalty. Not, not 10 years in prison, just five years. <clears throat> now, how could the church actually do this? Because there's a whole treasury of merit that's stored up by Mary and all the apostles, and all the super saints. There's a whole big, the image I have, which is my generation, is Scrooge McDuck diving into his huge uh, room of gold in the classic Disney show, DuckTales. But that's, again, for my generation. I see by your looks that it's totally not connecting with most people here, which is okay. Um, <clears throat> but there's a concept here of the treasury of merit where you could dive into the treasury, the gold of Mary, the good works of the apostles, and you can just grab a couple of their good works and slap it on your years in prison. Purgatory, sorry. Now, indulgences started in the year 1095. History lesson here. Anything significant happened around the year 1095? Anybody know what happened? Pivotal moment in uh, European history, 1096, 1095? Battle of Hastings, 1066, very close. Also a very important event. 1095, Christian, Muslim interaction called the uh, little thing called the Crusades start up. First Crusade, Pope Urban II calls for a crusade. And what does he do to make sure people are going to go on the crusade? He says, look, if you go on the crusade and you're a faithful Christian, I'm going to give you an indulgence. I'm going to, you know, and by the way, most of the crusaders were like third sons. They were the not favored sons. The firstborn, of course, at home because they had the land, the property. Like the thirdborns, the, the, I hate to say it, the less important children. <clears throat> you would never say that, of course, but the lesser important sons would go off the crusade. Um, and if they loved their family enough, they would do it so that their family would get years off. You know, the, the bad uncle 
the black sheep of the family, he'd get some years off in, in purgatory. And it worked. I mean, it was huge. The Crusades were great to start off with. But of course, by the, uh, by the 1500s, well, this becomes much more of a regular thing, particularly because the Crusades didn't work. The Muslims are still there, and they're getting stronger. You have now the Ottoman Empire over there in Turkey. And they're coming towards Europe. Okay, well, we need to fight them. And here are the real two motivations that led the popes in the age of Luther to start doing more indulgences. One is Islam. And two is uh, money. Because here's the deal. Um, <clears throat> pope Leo X, who's the pope that we're going to be talking about a lot with Luther, Leo wants to build a huge building just like King David did. He wants to build a huge temple, a house to honor God, a house that comes to be called St. Peter's Basilica. A beautiful building. I mean, gorgeous. I mean, you all have been there. It's, it's amazing. But, uh, you know, you need money to build buildings, right? And the Pope, the, the Pope had kind of <laughs> really overtaxed everybody. They had taken out a few too many indulgences in the past, but they needed one bigger one. They needed one that would really get people to give. And they had not really taxed Germany too much. They had not gone and asked for indulgences from the Germans yet. Because again, remember, one of the key issues with Luther is he's German, the Pope's Italian. There's a lot of, uh, you know, Northern Europe, Southern Europe anger that's involved in this in the Reformation. Now, <clears throat> there's a guy by the name of Albert. Albert is about 30 years old. He's an up-and-coming theologian in the Catholic Church. He's German, and uh, he needs some money to fund his campaign to become a cardinal, you know, which is the next rank he has in the Roman hierarchy, the, the Roman Catholic hierarchy. And so in 1516, he takes out some loans from the Fugers, a bank in Germany. And he needs some money next year, in 1517, to um, kind of cement his new position as cardinal and make people like him. And so he takes out another loan, and he still needs to pay off the first loan. That's a problem. So what does he do? He talks to his buddy, the Pope. And the Pope says, well, you know, I need some money too. You need some money? Here, let's do this. Let's... Uh, Let's set up an indulgence in Germany. And here's what, here's what I'll do for you, Albert. If you're my point man on this, if you run the show, I'm going to actually give you a second church office, which was illegal. But don't worry, I'm the Pope, so I'll make it okay. I'll give you a special dispensation. You can have two jobs and get the money from both jobs, and you'll be great. <clears throat> and so uh, Albert puts uh, his energy into this indulgence campaign. And the Pope says, look, Albert, if you do a good job, I'll give you a cut. I mean, this is like the mafia here. This is uh, how they were going to work things out. They're savvy businessmen. And so they begin this campaign. You have a section of the sermon here from Tetzel. Let me, uh, on your handout. Let me read to you this right here. This kind of tells you the way indulgences were preached. This is on your handout. <clears throat> Tetzel was the kind of preacher of the indulgence. He's a passionate guy. He says this, You should know that all who confess and put alms in the coffer will obtain complete remission. A coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. This is a famous quote here. And then he says this. This is real good kind of classic uh, manipulation from the pulpit, sadly. He says this, Don't you hear the voices of your wailing dead parents? They say, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. We're in pain. We're in severe punishment. You could redeem us with small alms. Just give a little bit. And you don't want to do so. Do you hate us? We made you. We fed you. We cared for you. Why are you so cruel and harsh? You don't want to save us. It just takes a little. We're lying in flames. I mean, you can see this is uh, this is great stuff. This is a preach, right? 
It'll, uh, it'll do something, won't it? Don't you care about your parents? I mean, don't you want to honor your father and mother? Just pay a little money and get them out of purgatory. That's what Tetzel does. Now, <clears throat> it's somewhat successful to begin with, but um, there's a lot of issues in a, in a place called Saxony, which is in, uh, it was in East Germany when it was split. It's in you know, Eastern Germany today. And the guy who is the head of Saxony is a famous guy by the name of Frederick. Frederick the Wise, he's called. I'm not sure how wise he was. But Frederick becomes uh, the guy who's in cahoots with Luther. Because Frederick is the guy who started up uh, the university where Luther teaches. So Frederick also has a problem with Rome. Again, they're Italian, he's German. He has a problem with this indulgence because it's threatening his relic collection. Relics, of course, were uh, special items from saints or Jesus. And Frederick the Wise had a collection of over 30,000 relics. It was said that if you spent uh, enough time at each one of those 30,000, you would get 1,900,000 hours off your time in purgatory. I mean, if somebody could, nobody ever did that, of course, but if you could do it, because again, just like indulgences, relics were a way, if you prayed at them and really prayed to the saint or the Jesus behind them, you would have a close connection to him and to his grace. Because grace in the medieval church is not a person, but a thing, a substance. So I, I've given you a collection here of uh, a sampling of the relics of Frederick the Wise on your outline. One piece of the Holy Land. I don't know how much a piece is. Three pieces of the stone where the Lord sweated blood. One piece of the beard of the Lord Jesus. It's an impressive piece of beard to last for that long. Two pieces of the crown of the Lord Jesus, eight complete, not incomplete, I guess, eight complete thorns of the crown of the Lord Jesus. Now, Frederick, let's be clear here. I mean, he, he, this, is, this is like his prestige project. This is one of the things he pours money in to hunt for these relics, so-called, and get them from all across Europe and the Middle East. And he wants people to come to his money-making, I'm sorry, his relic collection and pay the money to get time off their years in purgatory. He doesn't want people going to the Pope. Why send money to the Italians in Rome when you need to send it to good old local Saxons, good, local, honest, hard-working Germans? And so Frederick has a political and uh, you know, money involved in this sort of thing, too. Now, we come to 1517. We come to Luther. We come to the great day, the moment of the Reformation, as many see it. But let me, uh, let me correct some, some, some errors we can make. First error. Some people see Martin Luther as a raging, mad protester, charging the gates of Rome and tearing the house down and bringing the church down in destruction. Is that Reformation? That's what I begin today with. Is Reformation a revolution? Well... That's far from the truth. Luther presents his thesis. These are the 95 ones, not the 93 ones. So in October of 1517, Luther puts famous 95 theses. And what does he, why does he do it? He is presenting them out of love and zeal for truth, and the desire to bring it to light. Luther is a passionate guy. Yes, he's obviously a passionate guy. That's clear. But he is doing this because he loves the Catholic Church. He is doing this because he loves the Church. And again, as I've, as I've already mentioned, this is not the first time Luther nails theses on a wall for discussion. It's not the first time people did that. This is very common. Other people had done it on the same door. He is imitating what other folks had done. And he's doing it not for the masses. Originally, he's doing it, again, as a nerdy professor 
talking to other nerdy professors about this question of indulgences. <clears throat> and so, the 95 Theses. Let's look at a couple of them. I have them here. The bottom of your, uh, and page three on your, uh, your handout. The first one, the classic one. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he meant that the entire life of believers should be a life of repentance. Now, can someone read? I think we have time to do this. Can somebody pick up and read Matthew 4.17? Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Thank you, Lance. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, <clears throat> the Latin translation that all the scholars use, the Vulgate, translated it. I won't give you the Latin unless you need it. Translated the word repent as do penance which means get involved in all of our medieval system of paying for the penalty of your sin. And go to the priest, and he'll tell you what to do, and you just got to do it. Get indulgences if you can't, go to relics if you can't, and just work really hard and pay a lot of money to do it. Luther translates it into the German, not as do penance, not as indulgences. He turns it into a simple command, which... Lance just read, repent. A simple, basic command to turn from sin. You see here how at the heart of the Reformation is not just going back to ancient Rome or ancient Greek sources, but it's reading the Bible properly. It's understanding the Bible. It's translating the Bible into the common German, in this case, or our, our English language. He says this, this word cannot be understood as referring to the sacrament of penance. Rather, it means solely inner repentance. And so the 95 Theses uh, continue to argue that <clears throat> repentance and this whole system of indulgences, here's Luther's key point in these theses, has nothing to do with eternal life. Luther does not disagree with indulgences. At this point, Luther does not have a problem with the idea of the Pope mitigating the penalty of sin on earth. For Luther, it's very important to see this, that Luther's not some rabble-rousing rebel at the start. He has no problem with earthly indulgences. His big problem is with the Pope is not in charge of heaven. The Pope and his uh, bishops are not in charge of heaven. How can they make these claims about what happens when you die? Yes, I understand that the Pope is in charge of earth. He's the vicar of Christ on earth. Okay, that's great. But not in heaven. That's why I include uh, Thesis 54 here. Back of your handout. The word of God suffers harm if, in the same sermon, a preacher gives to papal pardons a length of time equal to or greater than the time given to the word. He does not say you can't give time to papal pardons and telling what the Pope has done. He's saying don't give as much time to, the, to that if you do to the preaching of the word. So his point is not to uh, reject the authority of the Pope entirely, but he is clarifying papal authority. He says this, The Pope does very well when he grants remission to souls in purgatory, not by his power of the keys, which he does not have, but by interceding for them, that is praying for them. And so we see here that the 95 Theses are not um, as radical a departure as we might think. Question on any of that before uh, briefly I discuss some reaction to them. We'll have to come back next week to our buddy Luther and his journey. You can also go far enough that you could sort of lie something for somebody down on the head of you 
Absolutely. Yeah. Grandma's, grandma's in purgatory still. Probably she is. We don't know how long she's been in there or how long she'll be in there. But, yeah, you can buy something for, uh, for grandma. I mean, if you love grandma, you would. Yeah. 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 Other thoughts? All right. So what's the reaction? Um, <clears throat> well, our buddy Albert, remember Albert? He gets a copy of the theses. And he says, hey, um, Luther's boss, von Staubitz, you need to handle this guy. You need to get a handle on your little monk over there. You need to deal with him. Most importantly, Albert forwards a copy of them to the Pope. And that probably is the reason why things get spiraled out of hand. If Albert had just handled it himself and said, look, von Staubitz, boss, boss monk, deal with Luther, he wouldn't have Reformation, at least not with Luther. But he does. And how does Luther respond? Luther hears about this. And what does he do? He preaches a sermon. It's very important to note here. I suppose I could include, I could, I could end on this. Luther's response to the academic and his boss getting involved is not to go back to his boss and say, I'm, you're right, you're wrong, whatever. His response is to go into the pulpit and preach a sermon. He chooses a different medium. Because the Reformation really is a battle. It's a mass media battle. It's a battle over which media is going to be superior, the media of the uh, medieval church and the media of relics. They can give you a sense of grace, but not Christ himself, a media of indulgences where you can pay money and get some time off. Or is it going to be about the medium of the word of God proclaimed? That really is the core question. Which media is going to work? And Luther, his theses, again, were nerdy. They were academic. They were not fit for uh, a, a general consumption. They were hard for the average churchgoer to understand. They're also in Latin. So he's not posting them in German, by the way. He posts them in Latin. So you've got to be able to read Latin to even understand them. But what's the sermon? A sermon's accessible. And in this sermon that he gives following the... Uh, the 95 Theses and following hearing about Albert, you know, getting upset at him, Luther does this, and we'll conclude here. He says, I know what the problem is with the Pope. The problem with the Pope is that he's blind. He's, he's blind to the corruption inside the church. If only he knew what was going on in his name, if only he knew what his advisors He's like the president of a country who doesn't know what's going on in the world, and he needs his advisor to tell him what's going on. Luther says, look, if the Pope knew what's going on, he would stop it in a heartbeat. He wouldn't do this. See, see what Luther is at this point? He's, he's a good Catholic boy. He believes the Pope, you know, has been led astray. And he thinks, if only I could tell him, then he would understand. You see here, Luther's goal is not to start a new church. This is, the, this is where I'll end with the, uh, the quote here. <clears throat> this is by Hans Hellebrand on the back of your page, your handout. People were drawn to Luther because his writings appeared to be theologically orthodox. They assumed the church would come to realize his orthodoxy and spiritual concerns before long. Certainly until his excommunication, 1521, Support for Luther was not taken to entail defiance of the Roman church. Luther, we do well to remember, outdid himself with expressions of loyalty to church and pope as late as 1520. And we'll get to that next time. But the point here is that what is Reformation? Reformation is not you and yourself going out and uh, breaking with the church because you feel like you've gotten a raw deal. It's not even you taking your theology or us taking, it's not Pastor John taking his theology and saying, I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to start teaching something, something radically new. The Reformation, at least we're looking at here with Martin Luther, was a reform of the Catholic Church. And that's why we would call ourselves Reformed Catholics. That's why we would call ourselves part of the one holy, apostolic, and Catholic church. Not capital C, not with the Pope, not any of this stuff. Reformed, but Reformed Catholic, connected. That's very different than what I was taught growing up. I was taught about the trail of blood. 
Now I thought about the fact that there were always these, these rebels who had, you know, attacked all institutions and who were just well-intentioned people who got together, who were passionate about Jesus. And we distrusted any, any organization, anything, any institution that was beyond our four walls. That, that's not the Christian life. That's not Reformation. Luther here shows that he is uh, connected to anyone who proclaims Christ as Lord. All right, it's enough for us today. Thank you for your time. Any last comments, corrections, pushback, reformation of what I've said today? Anything uh, you wanted to bring up? Once, twice. Uh, thing anymore. Remember, Pope Francis often indulgences for falling into the bathroom on Twitter. Just ten years ago. I forgot, I forgot about that. Um, that's how cheap they've become. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Pope Francis offering uh, indulgences for falling in them on Twitter. How low uh, we all we all can sing. Yeah, yeah that's good. Well, let me uh, let me close this in a word of prayer, and then we'll get back to Luther next uh, next week. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that we have not simply an example of those who follow you, but an example of those who seek to uh, have charitable views of your church. We thank you that you do bring in uh, all different stripes of folks into your body at all different seasons with uh, different desires to reform your church. We pray, Lord, that you would make us those who are passionate about uh, your church becoming more and more like Christ. If we would not manipulate your word, we would not disparage your word, we would not deny your grace. We would not view you as simply a taskmaster or someone who's happy with, with mediocre, sloppy seconds of righteousness. But Lord, you give us Christ and his perfect righteousness that we might live for him and to him. Strengthen us in this coming hour, we pray, by the same word and the same spirit that Martin Luther held to. For we ask in the name of Christ these things. Amen. Thank you all.